Welcome to uh, session six of Kingdom Exploration, uh, restoring our understanding of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Tonight we have perhaps one of the more significant um, foundation stones of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Uh, this is, uh, there'll be three sessions, we're going to do three, to, uh, maybe tonight, but at least two, on the foundation of the gospel of the kingdom of God. I call this lesson the New Testament Creation Matrix. I want to begin by looking at the, ob I want to begin by looking at the announcement of the angel Gabriel to Mary about the child she would conceive. And uh, through that, then we will also look at the New Testament creation uh, matrix. In this first session, I want you to take a look at the angelic announcement in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 to 33. It says there that the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So, right from the very beginning, from the very moment of the declaration to Mary about having a child, it speaks about this kingdom, that he is coming as a king and the kingdom that he has will be no end. Now I want to just look at a couple of scriptures. One of them, open your Bibles to Psalm 145. And I want to look at verses 10 to 13. Psalm 145. Ten to thirteen. See, some people think that Jesus brought and originated the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God, but what we find is that Jesus did not invent or uh, conceive of the message of the kingdom of God, but he amplified it and fulfilled it. In Psalms one forty-five verses ten to thirteen, it says this: "All your works." shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. Isn't that interesting? All the works of God's hands are going to praise him, and all his saints, the people, shall bless him. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. So this is the idea of the psalmist as he's speaking about the kingdom of God. Now we turn to Isaiah. In Isaiah, and you, this is very familiar scripture for those of us uh, uh, who have had uh, many uh, Christmases, we've, we've quoted this many, many times, Isaiah 9, 6 and to 7. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. And this is what my Bible says. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. 
That is, there's no end to the increase upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. Now, we'll talk a lot about judgment and justice in the coming, uh, in the coming uh, sessions, but I want you to tell, show you that he's going to establish his kingdom and put it in order with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. Now, there's a, a number of other scriptures I could point to, and, but I want to look back at this issue here of the angel. The angel says he will be called the son of the highest. I want you to see that the angel is referring to the relational identity. Relational identity. And then it says, he will reign as king over the house. He will reign as king over the house of Jacob forever. Now, this is his functional identity. Okay, so we have to come together. We have to come to grips with the fact that there is both a Relational identity and a functional identity for every human being. Every human being. Beginning with Jesus, of course, we have his example. But as we go through the study, I will show you again and again that every human being has both a relational identity and a functional identity. You are relationship with God. Is, is, is very simple. Uh, it's either a yes or a no. And your functional identity was given to you God in God when he created you. But you don't come into understanding it or experiencing it until you come into your relational identity as sons and daughters of God. We talked about that previously. We'll talk about it many more times. Now remember this. The Lord God has given... Jesus of Nazareth, an everlasting kingdom. Everlasting. That means there are no limitations. There are no geographical extents of jurisdiction. There is no duration of time. It is borderless. Now this is essential to grasp a hold of as we understand the gospel of the kingdom of God. Because we must understand, as it says in Psalms chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. The earth belongs to the Lord our God, and all the creatures, all the people, all the fullness that dwell therein belong to him. No one belongs to the devil. No country belongs to the devil. No land belongs to the devil. No plant belongs to the devil. No human belongs to the devil. The devil owns nothing. He's a pauper. He's, he's a liar. Everything belongs to God. The Lord God has given Jesus of Nazareth an everlasting kingdom without limitations. There are no limitations, either upward, downward, over, sideways, in any direction. There are no geographical extent of the jurisdiction of the kingdom of God. There is no duration of time. There's no beginning. There's no end. There's no beginning, and there's no end. And it is borderless. You don't come to a border and say, beyond here I cannot exercise the authority of the kingdom of God. The authority of the kingdom of God, when it's given to you and when you've received it, has no borders. Ephesians 3, uh, 1, verses 22 to 23 says, And he, the Lord God, 
put all things under his, Jesus' feet, and gave him, Jesus, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's important here that the tenses, and he put all things under his foot. Not that he will put all things under his foot. And he gave him to be head over all things. Not that he will give them. It's not a futuristic promise. It is a fulfilled reality today. It's essential to recognize that there are no jurisdictional limitations of the kingdom of God in any realm, neither time nor space, neither seen nor unseen. This is essential as we begin to understand the functional reality of the kingdom of God in our present day. Now, open up your Bibles to Philippians. Philippians. And what do I have here? I have Philippians 2, 5 to 11. <clears throat> now, we will come back to this again and again, but I just want to read this to you tonight to set the pace for where we will be going. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. This is what my Bible says. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Please, please hear what he just wrote. Please hear what Paul wrote to the Philippians. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore God, the Lord God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Please understand. Please understand the realm that upon the earth Jesus has the greatest name. Below the earth, Jesus has a greatest name. In heaven, Jesus has the greatest name. He has, and let's, let's go on. I want to go uh, every knee in heaven, every knee on earth, and under the earth shall bow. So in the concept of, of the early Jewish Christian believers, the believers in Yeshua, they saw a realm under the earth, not under the globe, but within the earth, that Jesus, every knee would bow, and every knee upon the earth, and every knee in heaven. In 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter, <coughs> let's see, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 21, and 22. Now, grab a hold of your seats here for a moment. I want you to understand we're about ready to look at something that if we can understand it, we got 1 Peter and it's chapter 3. What did I say? 21 and 22. Okay, here's what my Bible says. 
This is also an antitype which now saves us baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Okay, there's three arenas there. Angels. And then it says authorities. And it says powers. These are all in heaven. These are in heaven. They're not cast out of heaven. These are not fallen authorities. These are not fallen angels. These are not fallen powers. These are the ones who are still in heaven. And those angels and those authorities and those powers have been made subject to Jesus of Nazareth. Now, my friends, it is reasonable even likely that Jesus of Nazareth was sitting upon the throne in heaven as a man before man was created. Because we were found in him before the beginning of the foundation of the heavens and the earth. Jesus, it's reasonable I believe it's even likely that Jesus of Nazareth was sitting upon the throne in heaven as a man before man was even created. This may be the very root of offense that precipitated the pride in Lucifer that produced the fall. When Lucifer saw a man upon the throne equal to God in the same fact, isn't that what we just read in Philippians? He was equal to God. He shared with God that authority and that power. Is that not what we just read Philippians said? He did not think it was wrong being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. My friends, we may want to examine this model all over again. Take a moment and go with me to Revelations chapter 5. Revelations chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 to 3. Revelation five, one, two, three. This is what my Bible says. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seal? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Now, Again, I want you to see the realm of investigation for a worthy one. They looked throughout heaven. Okay, they looked throughout the earth. And they looked throughout under earth.
They looked in all three spheres of existence for a one who would be worthy. Now, I'm not saying that's the only spheres of existence. I didn't say that. But they looked into these three spheres of life to find if there was somebody who was worthy to open the scroll. Now, you go on to the next verses, Revelations chapter 5 and verses 4 to 5. And this is what it says. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Now, follow me here. So you understand the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll. He was qualified. He prevailed. He prevailed in the conflict in heaven. He prevailed in the conflict on the earth. He can prevailed in the conflict under the earth. He was the champion in every single situation and conflict. Jesus of Nazareth was the champion of every contest in each of these three domains or areas of conflict in heaven, upon the earth, and under the earth. See, He has won. He has prevailed. And that is why he is worthy. He is worthy because he has prevailed. And he has prevailed in all three realms. He prevailed in heaven. How did he do that? He prevailed upon the earth. How did he do that? He prevailed under the earth. How did he do that? In later sessions, we will examine the contest in each of these arenas in detail. We will go into detail of how he triumphed and prevailed in each one of these realms because God has given to us authority in heaven, authority on the earth, and authority under the earth in the name of Jesus as we administer, as we steward his prevailing victory in his name. Look with me real quickly in Revelations chapter 5 and verse 13. Let me write that up there for those of you who are keeping notes. Revelations chapter 5 and verse 13. This is what my Bible says. And every creature, how many? Every creature, every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. Again, we have the three realms, every creature in heaven, every creature on the earth, and every creature under the earth. There are three realms that he is dealing with. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them. I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to Him who sits on the throne, that's the Lord God, and to the Lamb, that's Jesus of Nazareth, forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. The twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped Him who lives forever and ever. Jesus prevailed. In verse 13, what does it say loudly? I heard every creature in heaven and on, or on the earth and under the earth 
and on the sea, and all that was in them, singing. They were singing, yes. Some versions say singing, some say saying. Either way, it is a declaration of the triumphant, worthy, prevailing champion, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ and the Lamb of God. Now, I want to take a few moments. All of this is summed up in the angel's announcement. The angel who comes from the presence of God, Gabriel, he says, I come from the presence of God, not to Mary, but he said that to, to others. I came to the, from the presence of God, said to Zechariah. He had a different vision than we do, doesn't he? But I want to take, I want to go beyond there now. I want to take a look at what I call the New Testament creation matrix. I want to just take a moment, and you'll turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. It says, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, so that we might see Him and perceive Him. Jesus came in the image of the invisible God, the first to be born over all creation. There wasn't anybody before Him, and there hasn't been anybody since Him. There has been no replacement of Jesus. He is not a secondary prophet, as some would have us to believe. It says here, for in all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Now you need to understand, this list is very specific. Thrones... We have thrones, we have dominions, and we have principalities. And we have powers. Now I know that in different translations, they will translate these words differently. It doesn't matter for the point that I want to make. It doesn't matter. So please don't get on to me and write to me and say, Oh, Brother Dave, in my version it says this. I want you to see that Jesus, by all things, were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and under, whether they are thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. He said clearly that all things, all things were created by Him, and through Him, and for Him. All things. There is nothing missing. You see? Now the question I have, these, my friends, are what is li are listed as, you might say, the building blocks of and elements of all creation. These are the building blocks and the elements of all creation. These are what's been created in heaven or on the earth, beloved, below, seen or unseen, thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. Where is humanity? Where does humanity fit? Huh? Where is the humans? Are we a throne? Are we a dominion? Are we a principality? Are we a power? We need to discern. Where is mankind? In Genesis, man was given dominion over all the earth to steward the earth on behalf of and under the rule of God. I got that in Genesis 1.28. 
Uh, just turn there real fast. Genesis right, 28, right in the beginning. It says, And God blessed them, and God said to them, that's both of them, by the way, man and woman, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. We are to have dominion. Now, dominion does not mean to have rule over. It, ha it means to take care of, to steward, to uh, guard, to uh, take care of. In heaven, on the earth, and under the earth, visible or invisible, seen or unseen. Now, I define this as a New Testament creation matrix. This was a part of what the early church were proclaiming as Jewish converts to uh, Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Christ Jesus would have explained this mystery during his 40 days upon the earth following his first ascension in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, after his resurrection and his first ascension, Jesus comes and for 40 days he speaks to the disciples about the kingdom of God. This is what it says here. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He spoke about the kingdom of God. So he would have explained what had happened from the time he had been seen by Mary in the garden and said, Do not touch me, until the time that he returned and said, Here, put your finger here. What, did, what was accomplished in the grave under the earth? What was accomplished in heaven above the earth? What was accomplished on the earth? He would have explained that. The Holy Spirit increasingly revealed this mystery hidden in God through the teachings and writings of the apostles, prophets, and teachers, which were implemented by the Genesis Church to turn the world upside down. Now, I need you to understand that this is a part of the great offense, the great offense to the Jewish people. Today, it is a great offense to the Muslim, it is a great offense to the Hindu, it's a great offense to the Buddhist, it's a great offense to all the different religions. Because it puts the whole responsibility of creation squarely upon Christ, Jesus of Nazareth as the Christ of God exclusively. Exclusively. Every other creation story or creation myth, when compared to this, is uh, faulty. It really offends the intellectual creationist scientist, because when I get to this, they cannot argue. There is no argument against this. This is one of the reasons why the Jews were so offended by the message of the kingdom of God and those things pertaining to Jesus of Nazareth as the Christ and the Passover Lamb of God. So that's what offended them. That's offending them is that this Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ of God, the anointed one who had done all of this, and he was also the Passover Lamb who paid the sufficient price that through that blood upon the cross and upon the altar in heaven, now we could come boldly into the holiest of holies in heaven, which the temple in Jerusalem was only a shadow of. My friends, that was offensive. In Colossians 1, verses 17 and 18, he goes even further. He says, he, speaking of Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things consist or are held together. 
And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, all things, he may have the preeminence. In all things. 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 Things seen. Things not seen. Things in the heaven. Things below the earth. Things upon the earth. That in all things he would have the preeminence. For by him. For him. Through him. Were all things created. And are now being held together. This variant creation story is a portion of the offense that the Jewish disciples and adherents of the gospel of the kingdom of God presented to their culture, which was found to be so objectionable. Now let me make it clear, this is not what? What does the word uh, preeminence that the word preeminence means to be standing at the front of or overall or most important in a situation. The one who would have the most honor the most power, the most uh, glory. So preeminence means exactly that, that that one is at the forefront of everything else. Everything else is in subjection to him. Now let me just root that word down. Everything, everything, everything is in Subjection. To him. That being Jesus of Nazareth. As the Christ and the Lamb of God. It's offensive to the writings and preaching of Paul to Jews, Muslims, and other religions today because it's contrary to their creation stories. It's difficult for Christians who are unskilled in the Word of God to comprehend and apprehend for their own experience the significance of the new creation matrix. This is also a great offense to scientific community who tend to reject any manner of intelligent design or creation matrix of any sort. They want to deal with evolution. They don't want to deal with the fact that God put it together and God is going to make it work. Look with me at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. This is what my Bible says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. See, that's the New Testament creation matrix. That's the, the source, the womb, out from which all things came. We need to understand this. If we are ever going to be able to grasp the full measure of the authority of the name of Jesus of Nazareth over every sickness, over every demon, over every culture, over every, everything that we have been commanded to take his name to. Now in the next session, I want to examine in the Gospel accounts the first words of Jesus. His first declaration, his own personal first declaration of identity and his first declaration of purpose in being sent. Why was he sent? What did Jesus say was the reason he was sent to the earth and to Israel? So I want to invite you to come right back in a few moments, maybe 10 minutes, and then we will move on to session six. Thank you very much. The Lord bless you and be with you and open your understanding that you might comprehend the scriptures and see the unparalleled majesty of this one who has preeminence in everything. Amen and amen.